Hello folks, welcome back to Furox Frank Reviews. Today is my 300th episode. Yes, it's going to be one hell of a hot summer. And, well, to mark my 300th occasion, I decided to take a look back at one of the greatest giant monster movies of all times. That, to this day, the franchise is still going strong. It's been nearly, it's been about 70 years, and ironically, he's doing better than, uh, than anything that Marvel or DC is actually doing at the moment. Oh yeah, I went there! And ironically, the character has kicked both Marvel and DC's ass in the comics. Not even joking about that one. Today, we're going to look at the original, the OG himself, Godzilla, in both a two, in this two-parta, that's going to be one big, long video, regardless. We're going to look at the original Gojira and Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Hail to the king, baby. The king of all the monsters. Before we get started, I gotta mention that this film was a um, bit of a passion project, and of course a uh, project that probably would have never got finished. Yeah, originally, uh, Tomi uh, the producer Tomiyuki Tanaka originally wanted to do a war film that took place in the middle of the Philippines. Unfortunately, there was a unfortunately the war, even though most of the Philippines were still like anti-Japan at that point in time, and uh, this was back in the early fifties. Again, they were still anti-Japan compared to what Japan had done at, uh, to them at that time. And Japan has mostly cleaned up at that point, but for many of them, the scars of the war are still there. So it wasn't working. And they had lost, and the company Toho had actually sunk a lot of money into this war film that was never going to, thanks to this complete misunderstanding, the film was never going to get made. Through his disappointment, Tanaka grabbed the flight, and headed home back to Tokyo to tell uh, the producers that the film is off. But on his way there, he looked at the window and watched the sea. And in that moment, he thought about, hmm, I wonder if there would be a way to actually make a monster movie based on a creature coming from the sea to attack Tokyo. Yes. And from that thought was the green light for the Godzilla film that we would get. So, but it wasn't without its merits. So Tanaka had decided to tell the producers to, okay, we lost money on the project, but we can actually make a little bit more money and actually make a brand new film with the money we actually originally lost from this other film project. And that, of course, was Kojiro. <laughs> and so they made a script and decided to make a full-blown monster movie instead. And this is actually the first time Toho had actually done in... Well, since before the war actually happened. Beforehand, Toho actually did actually get their hands on made two unofficial King Kong films. One was called King Kong and Edo, which Kong supposedly actually changed size in that movie from being a giant ape to a human-sized creature from, from time to time. And there was another one that is completely lost to time, and nobody can find a physical copy of this movie because it was destroyed during the bombing raid to Tokyo at that point in time. <laughs> But apparently it was a Japanese version of King Kong, where it was a guy in a suit routine. But again, all that footage is gone. But both these movies are both gone. The only thing that remains is some production photos and some still images. That's it. Other than that, both films are completely destroyed. And so Toho's claim to fame now is just making some war films, and that's about it. Just war films. So Tanaka decided, let's, not, let's try making a monster movie. And keep this in mind, the year prior in the United States, the Beast of Twenty Thousand Phantoms was actually released to the public and became a huge bit, became a huge big hit for such for being the first B monster movie ever made. Mm. However, was this going to be enough for Toho? 
Now, along the lines, they didn't know what to think about the movie because they actually had never done a film like this. This was going to be a big budget film. So they figured, okay, we have to pull out all the stops and, uh, okay, how are we going to do this exactly? Well, it wasn't easy, but in the end, they got the film script all signed up and they even hired a couple of stunt actors to perform the monster in the suit. And uh, let's see. Before that, they actually had Akira Fukume to do the music, Ashiro Honda to direct the movie, and of course, legendary uh, effects director uh, Eiji Superaya to create the monster. Now, if you heard about the rumors saying the movie was originally supposed to be in stop motion, you know, all Godzilla scenes being in stop motion, yes, that was true. Unfortunately, because, uh, well, Superaya was a huge fan of Willis O'Brien's King Kong film. Unfortunately, Due to the time constraint, the movie was going to be set to be released in November of that year, and the production had just gotten started around April to May around that year. Oh. Yeah, so uh, they didn't have any time for that. I mean, to make all of Godzilla's scenes and make sure they were per- uh, well polished over, it would have took maybe approximately three years, according to them, to actually do all the scenes. Uh, but that's just a stretch. I mean, nowadays, you could probably get the scenes done within a few weeks if you have a dedicated team of uh, stop-motion artists to do it. I mean, today, that's easy. But back then, a whole no. And also, nobody was well adept to the stop-motion at that time. And also, trying to get Wills O'Brien onto the project would have been a much more bigger pain in the ass. I mean, if they got Ray Harryhausen, he probably would have done the scenes. But um, he was already doing a couple of other films at that point in time, so he probably couldn't have fit the film in his uh, time frame. So they opted for a man in the suit. That being said, they decided to look over what Godzilla should be. All they know is he's a giant monster from the sea. So he's a sea monster. And they actually and the suit actor who will play the role of Godzilla will be none other than Haru Nakajima, who I hate to be the asshole to say this, pushed Jackie Chan to shame compared to all the stunts he went through during the movie. This one and every other film afterwards? Seriously! I mean, he puts Jackie Chan's uh, career to shame. I'll put it this way. He's basically the Jackie Chan of suit acting. That's how good this guy is. Yeah. That's how good Haru Nakajima is. Now, here's what Nakajima actually did. They actually studied his role, because the fact he's playing as a giant monster, he actually thought the monster was going to be a giant frog at one point, or even an octopus. So you know what he so you know what Tanaka told him to do? He told him, hey, you should study on the role of just playing a you're gonna have to be playing a big animal, it's just a big monster. So study big animals. So you know what he did? Every day and during his lunch period, he went out to the zoo and told he went to the zoo and he watched animals. Yeah, to study their movements, particularly bears. Yeah. Hmm. Bears. So you can understand how big and lanky they move too. And ironically enough. That was the inspiration to how Godzilla moves in the movie. And so what happened? We uh, we wound up getting the Godzilla suit. So they decided to make Godzilla a dinosaur instead, and they didn't actually have an idea what his design would look like. So they went with children's books, giving him the body of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the arms of an, uh, the arms of an Iguanodon, and the back plates of Stegosaurus. Of course, these were from books from back in the 30s and 40s, before we knew what they look like nowadays. So... And so... Super Wise team made the suit and everything, and decided to give his skin to give his skin texture Kelroy scars. Why? Because the Lucky Dragon incident actually happened very recently, and they decided to use that as the current inspiration for the film. The Lucky Dragon incident was actually a ship uh, was a was a Japanese ship that was close to Bikini Atoll when the atomic bomb went off in 1954, and the survivors were all later killed off from radiation poisoning, and they suffered from Kelroy scars. So they decided to give Godzilla skin that. And so, and so after a couple of weeks, they made the suit, and all the cast and crew were ready to see what the Godzilla suit would look like, what their new big star would be, and he could, and Tanaka, and here we go, they revealed it, the Godzilla suit in general. And something funny actually happened. They asked Haru to move the suit, and they were imp- they were impressed by it. But he only moved it one step, like, yeah. And then, second step, <laughs> clap. Yeah, it turns out that the skin that they use, that the uh, material they used for the skin stiffened the suit to the point where he couldn't move the suit afterwards. So a second suit was made immediately afterwards with lighter materials. 
However, slight problem. The suit itself was over 200 plus pounds. Yeah, close to 250 pounds. And Haru Nakajima weighed maybe, I'm guessing as heavy as probably weighed approximately like 175 pounds at least. Because he's because he's like what? He's five ten because he's like five foot seven, five ten around that on the height frame. And he weighs around that or any ways around that point, eh, that much in weight. Here, keep this in mind. They had to have the studio lights on the entire time to make all of Godzilla's movements. In, in order to make the movements work, they had to make them move really fast while cranking the camera speed up. And when they played it back at normal speed, it looked like it was moving slow. Genius filmmaking. However, keep this in mind with the fact that they had the studio lights on. There was flames all over the set when he's destroying Tokyo. And after each take, Tanaka would probably spend maybe no more than an hour or so in the suit. And every time they were done with him being in the suit, they had to drain, they had to drain the suit. And out of that suit, a cup of sweat. Literally, just imagine this entire cup full of sweat. And that was from Tanaka wearing the suit for, more, for no more than an hour. Yeah. So at that point, throughout the entire filmmaking... It's supposedly it's rumored that Nakajima himself lo uh, actually lost a lot of weight during the filming, huh. but because of the fact, and also his skin actually suffered from bad abrasions from being, his skin rubbing up against the suit so much. So, so yeah, on hu inhuman conditioning, but yet after all that, the film was made, and uh, Nakajima lost uh, was around maybe 150 pounds at least after all that filming was done. God damn! Give that motherfucker a medal. Seriously. Because he had suffered a lot. But let me tell you something. The character he brought to life? Biggest movie icon of all fucking time. Yeah. Give that man a fucking medal. Oh, wait. They actually mentioned... Oh, wait. They gave him a mention in the Oscars several years ago before King of the Monsters... The American King of the Monsters films came out a few years ago. So yeah, they acknowledged the fact that he was actually a great suit actor, and if it wasn't for him, the franchise would never have worked. Damn right. <laughs> that being said, let's talk about the let's talk about the first for um, the first version of the movie called Gojira. Hmm. Oh. Nowadays, we just mostly call it the original Godzilla film, because that's what it was. Gojira actually is a combination of both uh, of two Japanese words that both mean gorilla and whale. So, if you want to see Godzilla as a gorilla whale creature, go on Pinterest or, just t or type it up in AI art, because I am not going to show any images of that shit. Because it is, like, completely crazy crap. And honestly, I kind of prefer this design more than the um, shit the AI comes up with. <laughs> But all that, huh? how's the film begin? It begins with, well, a ship being destroyed at sea. Yeah, just a Japanese ship being destroyed at sea. Yep, that's it. And, of course, Ogata, we're introduced to Emiko and Ogata, who, of course, actually have been dating for some time now. Now, originally, Emiko was supposed to, was actually scheduled to marry Sarazawa, Dr. Sarazawa, but we don't see Sarazawa at all throughout the, throughout the most of the beginning of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, he's kind of, like, mentioned several times, but we don't actually get the chance to see him until much later. So, But Emiko doesn't want, isn't really into the whole arranged marriages thing with their families, and and she's been seeing Ogato recently, and he's been and he's been working with the Coast Guard and Maritime Security, and so he actually wants to be called in, and, uh, well, they find out what the ship disaster, what's going on? We don't know what's going on. All right, so they send out, another, and so uh, Coast Guard sends out a ship, it gets destroyed, too. Yeah, it blows up in the middle of the sea. They have no idea what the hell is going on. They're just utterly confused, and so uh, it's and so the movie later cuts over to Odo Island, uh, and we see the natives of Odo Island, uh, and of course they actually did discover half the people who were around half the people who were actually destroyed from the other ships. Uh, they actually, because Odo Island is close by to where the ship disasters were, so the native ships from Odo Island went there, picked up some of the survivors, but they wound up dying later on, and then their ships started getting attacked. 
one of the old timers actually said, This has to be the work. Damn it. This has to be the work of Godzilla. Damn him. Everyone thinks the guy is completely insane at this point. But according to Odo Island's tradition, and this is a tradition that actually they brought back in the most recent film, Godzilla Minus One. But apparently, the, the tradition is this if they actually if they appease and, and do a celebration and, a, and give a, a ceremonial sacrifice to Godzilla, namely a young girl, to go out to sea, he'll bring them a bountiful, he'll give them a massive bounty of fish. And since the fishing has been very poor recently, the old man assumes it could be Godzilla. And he was just a young kid when the last ceremony took place. And because of the events that would happen between the First and Second World Wars, they just gave up on those they gave up on those traditions a long time ago. Like several decades ago. So they haven't done them in years. So they haven't done them since like the eighteen since like the eighteen nineties. So, so yeah. Anyway, there's also a new there's also another reporter in this movie called Yamaha. Know, uh, call Yamada, who? Huh? Yeah, he's not like Steve, yeah, he's not like uh, Steve Martin's character from the in the Americanized version. And yes, Yamada is also in this version too, in, in both versions. But he actually play, he actually has more uh, somewhat of a connection. He actually plays a little bit more of a character development in this film. But in the American film, he's just just there. Nobody knows the guy at all. We don't even know his fucking name. <sighs> yeah. Talk about wasted character development. Reporters come to the island the very next day with Yamada actually asking the, asking most of the natives what actually had happened, what the reports are, and they're just as confused as everybody else at this point. So, nobody knows. So they do the Godzilla ceremony, and the old man tells Yamada about Godzilla, and... <laughs> Ooh. Like, of course, he doesn't believe him, and then again, can you believe, can you actually blame Yamada at this point? Silly folklore superstition at this point. They don't know what's going on. So they did the ceremonial thing. No girl was sacrificed, of course. Later on that night, a hurricane comes in and destroy, or I should say, a typhoon comes in and destroys and causes a massive amount of damage. But guess who all shows up? Godzilla shows up. But of course, in this version, we don't hear his roar or anything. That is the American version. Anyway, the only we see of him is this. Just uh, just that, his knee, wandering around in the background. Oh, one of the destroyed buildings. The following day, uh, the survivors are taken to Tokyo to give a report of what exactly happened in front of the subcommittee, and Doctor Yamane, you, Yamada, Yamane, good God, they couldn't give the they couldn't give the reporter character another a different name. I mean, shit, I'm actually re-recording this line too because I actually confused the name. Because I got his name confused with Yamane's name. Because they sound almost identical except for one syllable word. Unbelievable. So, anyway. Yamane actually says he wants to go to the island. He has no idea what's going on. But he wants to go to the island himself. With a team to discover to put piece together what exactly happened. Uh, uh, and the character of Shinji is actually a character. There's some scenes that were actually deleted with him. But... They sh some fans actually believe they should have kept the scenes in together, but him, he, he's actually one of the Odo Island survivors who's very young, but Yamani actually winds up adopting him as an adoptive son. Okay. Makes sense. And if you saw my Godzilla Heisei film series review a couple of years ago, Godzilla vs. Destroyer, the two main characters like the young student and the reporter character are actually Shinji's children. Yeah. Who would have figured, right? So Emiko and Ogata are along with actually go along with the along with Doctor Yamane to go straight to the island to find out what happened. And uh, as they're departing, they notice Sarazawa actually happened to be in the crowd cheering for them to actually come back and come back and safely. They get to the island; the whole island's completely basically fully destroyed. There's a deleted scene where Shin where Yamane takes uh, Shinji to. Pay respects to his family at their gravesite, which is a scene that probably many fans believe should have stayed in the movie, but it was one of those last minute things that were cut at the last minute. So, yeah. Whoop the fucking do on that one with the editing skills. So, they actually examine everything, 
And supposedly the scenes were supposed to be a lot longer, making this the following day we were supposed to discover Godzilla, but no, they kept the whole thing on in one day. So, <clears throat> anyway, they discovered their massive plot, their massive di uh, ditches and uh, holes all over the ground. They're not holes. They're the creature's footprints. They're also highly radioactive. And Yamani, to a, to a shock, discovers something. A trilobite. A trilobite. A prehistoric insect that has been extinct for millions of years is right there. He picks it up and it's still alive. So he actually puts it in a box for the scientists to take a look at it when they get back. So, but then, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah. The bell starts ringing. Oh, while that's happening, the bell's going off. Yeah, Godzilla is coming. So they see, but here's the thing, he's on the other side of the hill at that point. So, all the villagers come, all come up, running up the hill, all armed with katanas and rifles. Yeah, it looks like they're getting ready to go to battle. Anyway. <clears throat> Sarah, anyway, Yamani says, I saw it. A creature straight out of the Jurassic period. And what is it? Godzilla, of course. He's seen over the hill. Everybody starts freaking out, and yeah, he starts roaring. Godzilla just starts roaring like mad, like roar, roar, and then he goes. And then he just leaves. Yeah, he just leaves, and they see that they see all his footprints go right back into the ocean. By the way, I do have to mention in the original screenplay that was made for the movie, uh, Godzilla's motivation for actually coming out of the water is because coming out of the ocean was because he was hungry. So yeah, it was hunger that drove God's that actually the first Godzilla to come out into the water, come out of the water, and uh, well, that was actually later changed as to as the as the production progressed. But they actually decided to keep one little segment in there, like for example, when he comes when Godzilla's head comes over the hill. Originally, they actually had a cow inside of his mouth, but at the time, it just looked too gruesome, and they decided, no, forget it, just take it off. We'll just have his head come over the. Uh, Come over the uh, thing. Come over the hill instead. Yeah, and also originally when he was supposed to show up, exactly, Emiko and Ogato actually were taking were actually taking a stroll on the beach, and Emiko freaks out because she sees some certain rock formations in the distance moving slowly. But it turns out those weren't rocks; they were Godzilla's tail. So yeah, several more scenes were later deleted. So those are some more scenes that were deleted, some of which maybe for the best, and others I should delete them to begin with. Yamane addresses the, all of Tokyo and the and the counts and of course the government council of what this creature is. It is a prehistoric animal, and they decide to dub the creature Godzilla after the old island made, uh, after the old island legend because that's what the creature looks like. It's apparent that it is the monster of that legend, but it's slightly different. And Yamane discovered with all the radiation. That he's clearly a product of the H bomb that happened recently. So yeah, he's actually so his skin is literally covered in in Kelroid scars. That's not scales, Kelroid scars. So yeah, he's basically a nuclear survivor. So yeah, the government decides that uh, they want to get rid of Godzilla to get rid of Godzilla before he does any more damage. Uh, and of course, they decide to go after him using depth charges. And of course, everybody's celebrating at that. They actually they 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 have a depth charge operation. There's a deleted scene where Yamani's actually at a bar drinking, but of course, everybody's cheering at the depth charge scenes, and which actually leads him to getting depressed. And he wants him just going right home and wanted to be left alone. Of course, yeah, that scene was actually cut, but the scene of him going home was left in the film. I don't know. I guess maybe the death charge scene, that scene where he actually is at the bar drinking, and he sees everything. Because in this movie, Yamani actually wants to keep Godzilla alive, and he feels as if Godzilla is a very important uh, element of scientific discovery. You know what? In his perspective, it makes a lot of sense. So, but it's also, but he actually sees Godzilla as an opportunity for scientific value, but most of the people in the public see him as a giant menace. And can't really blame the people on that one. Can you? Because I sure as hell can't. Anyway, the Japanese... Anyway, Japan actually thinks that Godzilla's dead. They start celebrating. They have a boat out. And people partying on the boat. 
Then Godzilla pops up again. Yeah, he doesn't destroy the boat this time around. He just wa he walks right by it and goes right back into the ocean. People are now freaking out. It's like, okay, the depth charge thing didn't work. Oh shit! Now what? So, Yaman like the Yamani is called into the government and asking what they could do to stop Godzilla. He's giving him some alternative ideas that maybe just to keep him alive and actually have him move away from Tokyo. Huh. So rather than actually you know attack him, they actually make him progress further to Tokyo. Because when he the way he sees it. If they attack him, he progresses more to Tokyo, whereas if they actually try to lead him away from Tokyo by not attacking him, then he won't do as much damage as they originally thought. But uh, they don't listen to him, and, well, they said, we have to kill Godzilla. You know, at this point, it makes me wonder, what would happen if they just listened to the guy? Anyway, Yamada actually gets more information about uh, Dr. Serizawa, and of course, he actually goes to talk to Emiko about it. So Emiko actually takes uh, Yamada to Yamada to Serizawa, where we finally get to talk to Serizawa at this point. Serizawa is very dismissive about everything at this point, about all of his experiments. And um, Yamada later, later on goes back to the office. I should also mention that the two men, that there's actually two men in the scene with Yamada at the newspaper office. Guess who they are? The, what, the guy in the background is Haru Nakajima, the actor who playing Godzilla. And the man who gives him the assignment is the other act, is the secondary actor who plays Godzilla as well. And some of the other scenes where Haru just couldn't do the scene, he was just too exhausted, so they had a second actor do the scenes for him. So now, don't get me wrong, all of Godzilla's scenes that we see in the movie are mostly all of Haru Nakajima. Mm -hmm. But some of the other scenes, they actually had the other actor take over when they could but they had to do a rush production. Still, they had to hit, they had the other actor take over too. So he was one of the other he was one of the other stuntmen. Some other fun fact too: uh, the first Godzilla suit they made, they actually cut it in half. Uh, yeah, the suit was stiff, but they actually cut it in half and actually unstiffened it as much as they could. So the lower half was actually used for close up scenes with his feet, and the upper half was used with close up scenes of the chest and head. So that's one way to uh, save a lot of money. Instead of making the third suit, just uh, cut the first suit in half. Problem solved. <clears throat> they also had a giant. They also had a hand puppet too, but that's uh, beside the point. Anyway, <clears throat> after Yamana leaves, uh, em Sarasol actually has Emiko come downstairs with him to show. He wants to show her something. It's what he was actually working on, and of course, we don't really see it. But the music indicates that it was something horrible, and she freaks out over it. So, anyway, she promises. Uh, Sarazawa asks her to, to keep the secret, and she promises that she won't even tell her father. She heads home, and and of course, guess what happens? Godzilla actually comes close to the bay. Oh shit! Got shit got real, I guess. Godzilla starts walking out of the bay this time around. He's mostly confined to the dock section and, of course, the railway station. Which, if you saw my Shin Godzilla review, where I said that, that the scene where, God, where Godzilla's third form is actually um, just destroying the railway station, that's actually the same railway station from the, from the original movie. Well, we're seeing it in its original entirety. He's just walking, Godzilla's just walking on the goddamn train station, just destroying everything. One train actually crashes into his foot, and, of course, he, lit, he goes down Bites the damn thing, lifts it up, and throws it around like it was a toy. Yeah, Yamada is actually yelling at the military not to actually use not to actually use lights on Godzilla because it'll only piss them off further. They don't listen, and he continues destroying the rest of the railway station until he decides to go back to the sea. More meetings actually want to keep happening, <clears throat> and I should actually mention. The first time this actually happened, the movie actually starts supposedly in August, supposedly in late August, early September, and all this shit happening with Godzilla is like a couple of months is going by. So yeah, a lot of time is passing by at this point. <clears throat> Literally, like a lot of time is actually passing at this point. So at this point, it's already it's already like early like late October when this happens. <laughs> so yeah, that's another thing this movie never addressed was the time, and what's the time difference uh, in each of the attacks. Go figure, am I right? So, the SDF decides, yeah, the Self-Defense Force decided to actually erect electrical towers surrounding all of Tokyo Bay. Yeah. And keep this in mind, 
Godzilla is around 50 meters, is actually around 50, 51 meters tall in this movie. So, yeah, he's like 50 meters tall in this movie, so like, what, 164 feet? Close to 165 feet in, in height, and he's around 100 meters from head to tail. Makes sense. So, so, and so everybody's like all prepared for Godzilla's arrival, oh, and the military is just evacuating Tokyo, They're just evacuating as much as they can. And of course, Imani is still trying to actually convince all the the council members and everybody else that Godzilla can still be useful in science for in a scientific perspective. Um, of course, Ogata gets into an argument with uh, Yamani, but it doesn't really matter at this point. <laughs> and the night finally happens. November 3rd, <laughs> Godzilla shows up. And this time around, he actually makes his way up to the electrical towers, and we get the famous electrical tower scene. Where, of course, they turn on the power, and Godzilla goes right through the towers. In fact, he just tears them all of them down, and he uses his heat ray. The first time we see his heat ray, and that's when, and that's when the SCF and the government realize that was that's what caused the ships to explode. It was the heat ray. So yeah, he destroyed the towers, and now he's free to walk all over Tokyo. Godzilla just continuously walks throughout Tokyo, setting the whole city ablaze. Well, just destroying all of it. This motherfucker basically destroys the entire city. And a bit of a fun fact here. Throughout most of the entire sequence, the entire sequence in the original version is around 10 minutes. Is well over, t it's like 12 minutes, it's like 10 to 12 minutes long. It's a pretty long and intense sequence. And like 60% of the time of the of the screen time with Godzilla during this entire sequence, there's virtually no music playing. Yeah, normally we hear the military theme, Godzilla theme, and the other orchestrated music played beautifully by uh, orchestrated beautifully by Akira Fukube. Mwah. Great, fantastic music by the legend Akira Fukube himself. But here's the thing: the entire sequence when he's not, when there's no music whatsoever, it's fucking terrifying. And that's like sixty percent of the entire sequence. Literally, just seeing him, Godzilla, just walking around, hearing his footprints, him roaring, and just the sounds of the buildings crumbling around him. And keep this in mind, the entire sequence is shot at night, and it's all in black and white. If this was in color, they most likely they would use crimson color from the, from the flames. So, and yeah, the entire sequence looks fucking scary as hell. And many modern filmmakers say that that sequence, to this day, still fucking works. It's actually beyond terrifying. But hey, it's old, and it still works. Goddamn right it does. In fact, uh, t in fact, they actually later on use tanks to try to shoot and to stop him. Guzzle destroys them with his heat, right? He just, just wanders around Tokyo for ten minutes, just destroying the city. There's literally nothing... At this point, Tokyo is just taking it up the ass at this point. So, where they can't do anything. They're just literally powerless. We're seeing uh, like the biggest city in the, in the entire world, the biggest achievement in modern man technology at that point being destroyed, and there's nothing anybody can do to save it. Yeah, it's a complete feeling of pure helplessness. That is how powerful Godzilla is. So, He's so powerful, he made mankind feel powerless at that point. Just destroying the fucking city. <laughs> yeah. After his reign of destruction, he finally decides to go back to the sea by doing one more piece of destruction. What was that? He flips a bridge over. No, seriously. I mean, he just walks by to a bridge. He gets stuck on it. It's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he flips it over. Like, what the fuck? Uh, dude, you just destroyed the city, and the last thing you do is flip a bridge over? Asshole. Anyway, the SGF actually sent in jets, even though it's, like, way too fucking late at this point. <laughs> and, well, they try their best to try to shoot them down. It doesn't work. But the explosions actually lead Godzilla outward, because the explosions actually leave bright, uh, leave bright lights behind, which, of course, attracted him further out to sea. So he actually winds up going right back into the, right back in Tokyo Bay. So, the following day, 
the horrifying scene of, er of all the survivors from the Godzilla attack are now together. <sighs> it is so horrifying to see all this. And people are just helpless at this point. The country is beaten down and defeated. Huh. Amiko finally breaks her silence, talks to a guy that tells her what she act, what's the terrible secret that Serizawa uh, kept. And it was, he created a device called the Oxygen Destroyer, which, well, he discovered it by accident. So, much like when mankind split the atom here in the United States during the, uh, Oppo, during the uh, Manhattan Project, of course, so how the atom bomb was created. Serizawa discovered an uh, even worse power. And he said that a, an amount no bigger than a baseball can actually turn Tokyo Bay into a complete graveyard. However, what he doesn't actually say what happens until years later, when we discover how powerful the Oxygen Destroyer really was. If it was used on the ground, not in the water, Tokyo itself, which is the biggest city in the fucking world, will be a virtual cemetery, and miles around, the air particles will carry the entire um, the effects of the Oxygen Destroyer Virtually killing off anything else, uh, miles, like miles around. Yeah, it is just that devastating of a weapon. So he wanted to keep it completely secret from everybody. That's only found a proper use for it. Of course, uh, Ogata says that he, that that could actually be used to kill Godzilla. So he goes over. So he goes uh, with Emiko to try talking to Sarazawa. Sarazawa refuses to use the oxygen destroyer. They get into a fight. Ogata gets injured, and then he helps Ogata get uh, get better again. But of course, Sarazawa does not want to use the Oxygen Destroyer because he doesn't want to be remembered for making such a powerful, deadly weapon. But, but then Ogata talks some sense to him, saying that uh, uh, that he will also be remembered that if he doesn't use it, he'll be remembered as the man who actually had the weapon to destroy Godzilla and refused to use it. So, which of course, um, Sarazawa eventually breaks down. And then uh, a news report comes in with with the children actually praying uh, to the world to give them strength uh, for Japan. <laughs> Which, of course, later changes Serizawa's heart, and, of course, he decides to use the Oxygen Destroyer this time uh, on Godzilla. But before he does that, he takes all of his research papers and burns them all, because he doesn't want anything left behind, because this is a weapon was, because if this was used as a weapon, it's the most devastating weapon, more deadlier than the atom bomb. So, later on, huh, Ogata, Emiko, Dr. Yamani, and of course, Yamada is there too, amongst all things, on a ship in Tokyo Bay with the Oxygen Destroyer, huh, and of course, uh, to actually find Godzilla's location and use it on him. So, what? So, uh, so Ogata's plan is to go down there and drop the bomb off on Godzilla, but... Sarazawa tells him he's going with them because he doesn't even know how to how to activate the device. Just go. You know what? Don't argue with him. Just give him a suit. Just get going. They both head down there, and Godzilla, while he was napping, he finally wakes up. Like, huh? What is that? Thump, 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 thump. Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> there's also a deleted, there's supposedly deleted scenes of where, uh, you might, where a guy is actually attracting Godzilla with his flashlight, to, you know, because Godzilla actually has like uh, this is kind of weird, but Godzilla apparently actually has PTSD because the because the because the flashing light reminds him of the atom bomb going off. So yeah, the original Godzilla has PTSD. I'm not making that shit up. Who would have figured, right? So anyway, Yama uh, so anyway, uh Serizawa actually tells Ogata to go back up. He does, but he yells at Serizawa to come uh, come up with him. But he doesn't. He remains down there until Godzilla gets closer and then he throws it he activates the device, throws it at Godzilla's you know, right by Godzilla's feet, and of course the device goes off, engulfing Godzilla in the and the intense bubbles and in the chemical compounds, uh, which of course is killing him off. Uh, uh, Serizawa says, It is working. Sayonara, oh, my friend. Be happy together. So yeah, he tells. So yeah, he tells Ogata and Emiko to be happy together, and he takes out his knife and he cuts the line off. Well, Ogata freaks out about that thing. So 
Yamada, Shinji, and Yamane actually pull the wires up, pull the cables up, and they see that he already cut the wire. So, so yeah, Godzilla's completely engulfed in the in the compound. Serizawa dies at the Serizawa actually dies uh, during this whole process. Godzilla makes one more uh, makes one more surface uh, makes one more surfacing, roaring in pain, and then he topples over, heads down to the ground. And his body disintegrates into a skeleton, and the skeleton vanishes. And so, Godzilla is now dead. <laughs> Emiko was uh, sad and depressed. Everybody's actually kind of sad that Sarazawa sacrificed himself, but it was kind of obvious what he was trying to do, because he didn't want the oxygen destroyer to be used again. So he killed himself to make sure that it could never be made again. So, yeah. The recipe is gone. The only other person who knows the recipe is Sarazawa himself, so he took himself out of the equation. But that's not the darkest part of the ending. The darkest part of the ending is what Yomani says at the end, is that the uh, the, that Godzilla was a creature that survived millions of years of extinction and thrived and was exposed to nuclear radiation and wanted revenge against mankind for it. And if they're not careful with all the nuclear testing, that another Godzilla would actually appear. <laughs> Somewhere around the world. Cue the sequels! And so everyone gets a final salute to Sarazawa. And the movie ends on a dark, semi-happy tone of them looking out, looking out to the sea, hopefully for a bright future. That is until the sequel came out. <laughs> and that, my friends, was the original Godzilla. Known as Gojira. And you know what? It is... How do you say... A fucking classic. It is considered the greatest giant monster movie of all time. And how good is this movie? It actually made it all the way up to the Japanese Academy Awards that year. In 1955. And almost won, but lost to Seven Samurai. Yeah. And considering the fact that Seven Samurai is one of the greatest movies of all time, it's kind of obvious. That, okay, so, yeah, you kind of see Godzilla lost in that one. But ironically enough, the actor who plays Yamani in that movie, in this movie, also plays one of the samurais in Seven Samurai. Man, that guy lucked out. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, I'm going to take like a 15 minute break here. So, um, when I come back, I'll talk about Godzilla King of the Monsters. Now, folks, let's talk about Godzilla, King of the Monsters, the original version, not the, uh, not this one, of course, but, um, actually, there's a bit of a, a little bit of an Easter egg in this movie that relates back to the original King of the Monsters in this one, but I'll get to that a little later. Anyway, the movie actually winds up starring Raymond Burr this time around, and here's the thing. All of his uh, stuff, all of his work was actually done within a within a Hollywood studio backlot, and it only took like maybe a week to get all of his scenes done. That's about it. All they did was edit all his parts in with the movie, and uh, that was a, that's how they made his version of the movie. Due to the fact that Raymond Burr was actually very famous for playing the Perry Mason character in the Perry Mason TV show, which if you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's a really good show. Yeah, I mean, seriously, Perry Mason is a surprisingly very good show. I mean, I'm not even through the first season yet on Amazon Prime, but damn. Seriously, Burr's acting is fucking awesome. Give that guy a medal. He's good. Yeah. So anyway, the movie basically starts off with Tokyo destroyed and Baby and Burr already in a, in a desolated building. So, yeah, they're going through the... Okay, so... The monster attack already happened, so they're doing it in a via flashback. Oh, no. Okay, well, okay, to be fair, this actually hadn't fully happened yet in monster films, so uh, that's another first, too. So, yeah. However, where the first, where Gojira was actually treated like a like an A-class movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters, on the other hand, was treated more like a B-film. Yeah. 
and keep this in mind, this movie came out two years later after the original Gojira film came out. And at that point in time, the sequel, Godzilla Raids Again, was already out uh, in Japan. And did relatively okay at the box office. I'll get to that movie. So I will get to that movie later on, just not today. huh? Because I'm only going to do the original film and its American counterpart. So, so the movie basically starts off with, with Raymond Burr's character, Steve Martin. And before you say anything else... Yes, the actor Steve Martin has actually uh, has actually given a note a cease and desist notice to Hollywood and Toho not to use his name in the Godzilla film series. But uh <laughs> they found a way around that in this version. <laughs> yeah. As a giant fuck you to Steve uh, as a giant fuck you to this jerk himself. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll get to that later. But until then the movie basically starts off with him and going actually uh, surviving the, the Tokyo's destruction, he wakes up and he sees everybody around him is dead. He tries to wake somebody up. He tries to wake up one of the officers, but it's too late. He's already dead. He describes that what happened was a complete living hell, and what happened here was almost like, compared to a week. Yeah, he's only supposed to stay in Tokyo for like maybe uh, a few days, so he wound up staying for a couple of weeks instead. While the, while the first, while the original movie took place in, over a period span of a few of a couple of months, this one in the American version takes only a few weeks. Yeah, up to a couple of weeks. Yep. So before he can do anything else, he passes out and he actually wakes up in the hospital, in the military hospital where everybody's actually you know surviving and you know getting their wounds tended to. Emiko actually sees him, and in this version of the movie, Emiko actually does know Steve. Because Steve actually was supposed to talk, actually know Sarazawa because he actually went to college with Sarazawa many years ago. So my guess is that this was before the war actually had happened, and before well, well they were both young, and before Sarazawa had to be had to go back to Japan because of the whole wartime thing. Huh? So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that's not exactly good. Huh? Or anything. but they kept, but they still kept in touch while Steve, uh, but Steve and Sarazawa both kept in touch years later. Huh? So, uh, and Emiko actually does know Steve well, but because he actually met her when she was a little girl at that point, but he was just a teenager at that time, and Emiko was just a little girl back then, so she does actually know him through Yamani. So, yeah, Yamani and Steve actually know each other, too. Ogata, he only knows Ogata, like, from a few areas, so he doesn't know Ogata that well. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, Steve actually does interact more with the characters in the original film, but here's the thing. How they do that? Like this. Yeah. I'm Steve. Here's like uh, one of the main characters. They just have their back to the camera. <laughs> that's ingenious. <laughs> the only other character that's actually with Steve throughout most of the movie is, uh, is a security officer by, <laughs> by the name of Tomo. And uh, apparently Tomo, uh, Tomo actually dies later on in the movie. But, so apparently Tomo was actually named after Tomoyoki Tanaka. The, the executive producer of the Godzilla film. So that may explain a couple of things. So, hmm. so yeah, Emiko actually tells Steve that she's going to get him a doctor, that he needs to sit back and relax. While Steve basically tries to sit back and relax, he thinks back to what, how it all started with him on a plane, just reading the newspaper and about to fall asleep, and down below, Godzilla attacks the ship. Yep, it's one of those movies. When Steve arrives in Tokyo, he actually he gets uh, sent to the security office where he meets Tomo, and of course, uh, Tomo asks him a few questions about what happened, what actually happened during the flight. Uh, you know, asks him a few questions about what happened during his flight. But here's the thing: Tomo and everybody else have, and all the security officers in Tokyo asked all the people on that flight if anything had happened because they were close by. Because apparently, their flight was close. To, it was around the area where the uh, where the first where the first attack was. So Steve was relatively curious, and he asked if he can actually uh, accompany uh, Tomo. Tomo says, okay, sure, why not? And, of course, we see, and this is where Steve actually sees Ogata. And, of course, they talk about uh, how the ship sank, and they said they sent out a rescue ship to see if there's any survivors. And it gets destroyed by Godzilla. (laughs) Oh, you just gotta love the fucking irony there. (laughs) Yeah, it sucks. (laughs) So they have no idea what's going on, and of course they're all stumped about what's been happening, and they don't know what the hell's going on. And of course, uh, 
Steve actually wants up calling his boss and telling him he's going to be staying in Tokyo a bit longer than expected because he's going. He was supposed to meet Doctor Serizawa later uh, for a dinner, but unfortunately, Serizawa was actually busy. So he decided, so Steve decides to stay longer because this whole situation with the ships is actually more interesting and it's a bigger story. So he calls his boss off in Chicago and tells him he's going to be staying in Tokyo a bit longer to actually follow up on the situation. Huh. And of course, this is where Steve actually wants is actually joined with Tomo with more. With more of a government meeting of what they're going to plan to do. And of course, uh, this is where we see Dr. Yamani for the first time. Now, here's the messed up part. The way they did the scene, this is actually a scene from happening later in the movie after Godzilla's emergence. So you're going to hear Yamani say Gojira, actually say Gojira. So yeah, keep this in mind, like the whole sequence are speaking Japanese. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to hear Yamani uh, say Gojira <laughs> once or twice during the whole sequence. You know what, by today, you know, by today, if they wanted to re-release King of the Monsters again, they really just need to redub the whole movie. Yeah. Just redub everybody's lines in pure and just in full English at this point. <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't hold up by today. It doesn't hold up by, by today at all. <laughs> nope. It doesn't. But it's funny, to say the least. So anyway. Dr. Yamani says that, uh, that the attacks happened near Odo Island, of course. And, of course, Steve and, uh, and of course, we get all the Odo Island sequences. <clears throat> which, of course, Steve and Otomo actually do wind up going with, uh, going with Yamada at this point. Which Yamada is actually in the movie. He's just there. But we don't know who the hell the guy is. It's just like, oh, hey, it's that, it's that guy again. Like, oh, hey, it's that guy. Hey, it's that guy again. <laughs> who are you? Who are you? I'm your motto. I'm like the, I'm like the main character. I'm like one of the main characters in the movie. Now in this film, you're not. What? I'm not the main character. Nope. You see that American character right there that's just added into the footage? Yeah, he's the main character of the movie. You're just here for no fucking reason. Oh man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, is there any scene I have in the original movie that was better? Yeah, you actually. Yeah, you have a scene with Doctor Serizawa. Oh, okay. Good, sweet. So anyway, Steve and uh, Steve and Tomo actually talked to a couple of people. And one of the native Ameri and one of the natives they actually wanted to talk to actually says he saw a monster. And of course, Steve thought the guy was probably on so uh, drank too much sake. If he was drinking too much sake, I want some. But in all seriousness, I wouldn't mind having a wouldn't mind having some sake right about now because it's been several years since I've had sake and. Uh, it's really good shit. No, seriously, especially when it's hot, fucking delicious. Anyway, um, they they actually go to the performing ceremony where they're doing the Godzilla ceremony again, and this time the old man says Godzilla, and Steve kind of connects the dots saying, so they think that their Godzilla is the one that caused this whole thing? Well, that's what they said. Hmm. So Steven and Tomo, while the typhoon scene actually winds up happening again, Steven and Tomo are actually inside of a tent, but their tent gets destroyed from the intensive winds. And Godzilla was a give, was given more additional roar sequences in this one to convey the horror of the movie. But it's designed more as a uh, B film, and we get a lot of Steve's narration, you know, like a lot of Raymond Burr's narration of Steve Martin throughout the entire movie. So, yeah, Steve, along with the survivors, actually winds up going back to Tokyo, giving all their statements. Uh, Yamane actually is convinced there is something out there that he wants to go to the island himself to see you know, what's been happening. And, of course, he wants to... Anyway, Steve actually talks to Yamane and tells him if he, will, if he can join along, because he was actually on the island, too, so maybe he could be of some use. And, of course, Yamane says, of course, that should be fine. But if you re if you watch this movie with the, com with the uh, commentators on it... <laughs> The funny thing is that's actually true is like Yamani doesn't even look up to, to talk to Steve. He has his head down the whole time, like, oh, hello, like, oh, hello, Steve. It's like, uh, you do realize that Raymond Burr is like what six one, and the actor who plays Yamani is like is five foot seven. Uh, you might want to look up there, pal. <laughs> Seriously. So they go back to the sh so they go back to the sh uh, so on the ship. Uh, Steve notices that uh, Emiko and Okada are actually getting along pretty well, and he connects the dots that those two are actually a bit of a couple. 
So while he also does confirm the fact that Emiko was actually arranged to marry Sarazawa when she was old enough, uh, and once his su- and once his studies were done, but unfortunately that didn't exactly happen. She's been seeing Ogata on the side. Yep, love triangle. And Steve is like, "Oh no, I'm not part of this love triangle. I'm on the outside here. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll leave me out of this, okay? Let me have it. You got you three sorted out. I'm just gonna take my pipe here and smoke it." All right, you guys take it easy. <laughs> Anyways. So, so anyway, they make it to the island. That's when they discover the footprints. Everything's contaminated with radiation. And this is where Yamane discovers the trilobite. And, of course, Steve goes, Trilobite, isn't that thing extinct at that point? Until they discover Godzilla's nearby the area. They go up the hill, Godzilla is up there roaring. His scenes extended a bit longer in this version, so uh just to convey the terror while Tomo actually and all the others run away, while Steve actually goes out to, uh, actually decides to help people out. It's a, it's a, um, Tomo actually injures his leg actually sprains his leg ankle. Steve actually helps him up uh, and so it's like, okay, Godzilla leaves, it's like roar. So they go up the hill, and Steve says, look at the size of those footprints. And we get to narrate, and then we get the scene where they're back in the back in the government building, and of course, Yamane's giving all the information about Godzilla as best as they can, of what he is, where he came from, the nuclear uh, connection. And we get the biggest fuck-up of the entire film. That this is probably one of the reasons why the film needs to be redubbed. They uh, uh, said, according to this photograph of Godzilla, this creature is over 400 feet tall. Uh, yeah, that doesn't happen until this film, idiots. Honestly. So, he's not 400 feet tall, he's actually 50, he's actually 164 feet tall. Morons! This is one of the reasons why the film needs to be redubbed. It's the biggest fuck up in the entire movie. But of course, everybody now it completely ignores that line. So, anyway, Steve actually winds up calling back to his office in Chicago. His boss wants all the scoop on this monster on Godzilla. <laughs> so he tells him that the, the military is going to plan to actually destroy him using depth charges, but he's going to stay in Tokyo a bit longer just to, until this whole situation's over with. You know, I give I give Steve a lot of credit though. He's like the one character that's staying behind and actually making sure this whole thing is seen through to the end. That's one hell of a story to be a part of. Seriously. Anyway, the depth charge plan scene comes and goes. They get a party scene. Everyone, Steve says that now they think Godzilla's dead. They start celebrating until he shows up again, attacks, uh, uh, actually scares people on the boat. Uh, uh, and this time around, we actually have a scene where Steve is actually talking to Sarazawa huh? and says that Emiko is going to be coming by later on, and he'll actually talk to uh, Steve come by later on. <laughs> so now, here's the thing. We actually see Emiko go to Sarazawa's house, but he actually t- he shows her the experiment, so, uh, but we don't see it, of course, until like, much later. <laughs> uh, Emiko goes right to the house, and this scene doesn't make any sense. At all. This later scene doesn't make any sense, but Anyway, Godzilla actually winds up showing up again, <laughs> and this time he attacks the railway station again. <laughs> so yeah, and this time around, like uh, Sir, Yamani and Ogata's and Ogata are actually helping the civilians go up on the hill, <laughs> and ironically enough, Steve and Atomo are both there. Yeah, the scene makes no sense, but apparently there was actually a scene that was deleted in the American version where Steve and Atomo actually wound up having dinner with Sarazawa. And then the alarms went off, and so Steve and the Tomo decided to go out there to actually help the civilians out. So, other than that, the scene makes no freaking sense whatsoever. They just happen to be there. So, it's weird. And, of course, more additional screams and yells were actually added into the movie, aside from Godzilla's roar. So, yeah, Godzilla walks around to the rail station, a train crashes into his foot, he goes down, bites it, waves it around his head, plops it down. (laughs) 
and continues destroying the entire railway station, and it's back to the sea. So, the next day, they actually continue what the next plan that they're planning to do for the stop god. So, Steve is actually there, but he wants to believe him to actually write in the reports of the paper for his, uh, for his Chicago news editor. Uh, so, Otomo comes in and tells Steve what the plan, what the Defense Department is actually planning. And he shows him the high electrical tower sequence. Yeah. Even though in the original movie it took, even though in the original version it took at least several, almost a week to go those, uh, get all those towers up. In this movie, it's like the very next day. <laughs> movie magic, people! <laughs> movie magic! <laughs> oh. This is not going to end well. So the night finally happens where, God, uh, where Godzilla's going to attack Tokyo. Steve, this time around, is actually in the is actually in the news report building with a, with a couple of other news reporters uh, from earlier in the beginning of the movie. <laughs> so we all know what's we all know where this is going to go. So yeah, and here's the thing: he actually records the entire sequence. He actually has a tape recorder recording everything. He tells them everything about what Godzilla is going to do. So Godzilla comes up out of the ocean, attacks the electrical attacks the electrical towers, destroys them with a heat. With his heat ray and proceeds to turn so- Tokyo into a sea of fire. And you know what? I'll give Steve, I'll give Raymond Burr credit in this one. He actually doesn't play it like a joke. He actually plays it full fucking serious, too. In fact, one of the reasons why he actually came back to do his character again in Godzilla 1985 is uh, if they take his if they take Godzilla seriously. Because if they didn't take him seriously, he wasn't gonna do the movie. Yeah. So it's because of the fact he actually saw the original he saw the original uh, English cut of the, of the film before the American cut version was made, and he says that version was a lot better. But he says because the fans actually like his narration, they brought him back. So throughout so throughout the entire sequence, the movie is narrated the entire sequence is narrated by Steve for a chunk of the uh, attack. And yeah, Godzilla just continuously destroys everything, tra- trashes the city, burns down buildings. But the whole sequence is shot out of se- it's completely shot out of sequence, like literally, like it's shot out of place. So, like some scenes happen earlier, huh, some scenes happen from earlier, happen later, some scenes happen later, shot earlier. It's like what? So, I mean, seriously, good God, huh. it's completely shot out of order. I think the best way to describe it is they actually show the original the original sequence again, only have Steve's narration during it. That probably would make the scene that probably would make the scene a bit more effective, in my opinion. But yeah, Godzilla continues to destroy the entire city, like so, and the entire attack sequence is actually cut down by a few minutes because in the original version it was ten minutes long, it was ten to twelve minutes long, and this one it's around seven minutes. So, so yeah, they cut so they cut a lot of footage out. So tanks come by. They shoot him in the chest. He burns them up. <clears throat> yeah. And there is one line that a lot of people do like in this movie, and that's uh, nothing can save the city now. He's turned the whole... Uh, Godzilla basically turned all of Tokyo into a sea of fire. Right. But there's one sequence that's actually in both versions of the movie that doesn't make any sense to me. It's probably when... Go- it's when the... Uh, it's when the command is when there's a command car or a cop car is actually getting orders and a bunch of cops are around it uh, listening into the radio broadcast uh, or what needs to be done. Godzilla sticks his head up from behind the building, sees the car, shoots his heat ray at it, and blows it up. It's in both versions of the movie and it doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, okay, you're destroying the entire city, but you take your time and out of your schedule of destroying the city. To blow up one car. Why? It doesn't make any sense. It's in both versions, like I said. (sighs) At least I will give them credit on this one. Like, uh, most of the music sequence is mostly cut down on this, actually, to engulf in the terror of the movie. So, it does somewhat of a decent job, but but when the music comes back up, it does a really good job. And there is a sequence where Godzilla actually does hurt his ten feet when he's going through the electrical railway again, but the hot, but it's more higher voltage, and he get, and his tail actually swings into the theater house, so, so where the movie was actually shown. Bit of a fun fact: 
in the original version of the film, <clears throat> the scene where Godzilla act, where Godzilla's tail actually hits the uh, opera house uh, where the theater was at, where the movie actually premiered, everybody in the theater. <clears throat> sorry, my throat's starting. My voice is starting to go. One second. Mm. Mm. Everybody in the theater that saw that freaked out. Why? Because they were watching that movie, that very movie, in that same theater where Godzilla's tail attacked. In fact, many people jumped out of their seats at that point in time in the original, in the, its premiere. So, yeah. Keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, that's the original film that works. In the American version, it's just, it's not as effective, but it works pretty well. <laughs> and also, uh, I forgot to mention this in the Japanese version, but he actually does go up to Tokyo Tower, and he walks up to it, though, grabs the tower by his hands, takes his head, and bites down on the freaking, uh, on the tower itself. The reporters that are there, they're actually just, they're continuously broadcasting as they're about to die, you know? And so what does Godzilla do? He takes, he bites the thing with his mouth, and he pulls the thing down to the point where the entire tower tips over and gets destroyed. So yeah, Godzilla continuously destroys the entire city until the point where he actually is right by, he's, on, he's right by the same building Martin is in, and of course he, he says, all right, George, this is it. Steve Martin signing off from Tokyo, Japan. Basically, Godzilla destroys the whole building, and the the ceiling caves in on uh, on Steve Martin. So now we know what actually happened to him. Hmm. Right, but he does survive. Uh -huh. but anyway, Godzilla makes his way back to the back to the bay, flips the flips the bridge over, just flips it over for no apparent reason. The fire pilots come in, they start shooting at Godzilla. It doesn't do a damn thing, and he goes right back into the sea. And that's the end of Tokyo. There goes Tokyo. Anyway, going back to the beginning of the movie again, uh, we see Steve is still in bed, and he actually has a bunch of bandages on him. And, you know, after watching this film again, I realized something. I had just watched Godzilla Minus One a couple of times on Netflix in English this time around. It's awesome. You should watch it, by the way. But, uh, there's one of the, char one of the surviving characters actually has pa actually has bandage pl placements uh, Exactly identical to Steve Martin's uh, bandage placements from this movie. So yeah, apparently that the Japanese film audience actually liked the American version too. So they also like his character too. So I think it's clear to say that both Japanese and American film audiences like the Steve Martin character. Oh yeah, they do. So Ogata, so this time around, Emiko actually brought Ogata with, uh, with her to check up on Steve, and she actually breaks down, and she tells them both that she knows that she, there's a weapon to defeat Godzilla, that Sarazawa created it. So, so she tells them everything about the Oxygen Destroyer, and Steve, so Steve and Ogata convince her to talk to Sarazawa to get to get him to use the Oxygen Destroyer. Hmm. So yeah, we get the whole sequence of that, of Steve, uh, uh, hmm. Steve was about to actually go on, uh, to actually get out, out of his bed, but, but Emiko stops him and tells him that her and Ogata can do it. And so they go see Sarazawa. They get into a fight. He actually injures Og Ogata. And he has to change her heart once the, pray once the prayer song is actually shown on television. So he comes to a census to use the oxygen destroyer this time around. <laughs> and so <laughs> Steve, along, uh, Steve along with Ogata, Sarazawa, Emiko... Yamani and Shinji. Yeah, I forgot to mention Shinji. Yeah, Shinji's barely even in this version, too. But he's in this movie, regardless. Uh, throughout most of the scenes. And, and uh, yeah, Yamana's there, too. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, it's like, hey, guys, I'm still in this movie! <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. So they locate Godzilla. <laughs> Ogata and Sarazawa go straight down to the bottom, where of course they find Godzilla. He he walks right towards them. Ogata actually uh, gets surfaced. Uh, Sarazawa waits until Godzilla's close by, activates the oxygen destroyer, throws it at his feet, and of course it gets engulfed in the gets engulfed in the chemicals. Whoa! 
And of course, Sarazawa tells everybody goodbye, live happy, tells Emiko and Ogata to live happily ever after, and he says goodbye. They pull up the wires, of course, he cut the wire, and he dies so, from the chemical exposure. <laughs> Godzilla makes his surface one last time to give his final roar, and hits all the way down, and dies. Same thing, of course, he, uh, his body disintegrates, then his skeleton disintegrates. And the movie ends on a somberly sad note, knowing that Sarazawa sacrificed himself to kill Godzilla. All right, the movie ends on this on this uh, note where where we hear Raymond Burr, Steve Martin say, "The whole world can wake up and finally live again," hmm. knowing that the menace is the menace is gone, and so is a great man. But now the world can wake up and live again. The movie ends right there on the spot uh, with the prayer song, and we get the end credits, and that's the movie right there on the spot. That was Godzilla King of the Monsters. I'm not gonna lie, I did like this movie a lot when I was a little kid too, because it was the first Godzilla film, but it was in black and white, unfortunately. And well, it did get a mostly a mixed reception, but it was mostly you can see that's a pretty decent movie. And of course, like nobody in America actually saw something like this yet. So, with the editing skills at the time, it was probably a bad idea to actually mix to mishmash the footage because they didn't know because most people didn't speak Japanese back then. But nowadays, they know what Godzilla's name is in Japan, and the movie was actually and the original J Japanese version was unknown to America until two thousand four for the sixty year anniversary for the fifty year anniversary. Go figure, am I right? In fact, that's when I got this, that's when I got this collection. It was in two thousand five. Yeah, I got this. I've had this movie for almost twenty years, for almost thirty years at this point. Go figure. Now, that being said, was this movie very successful? Well, yeah, it actually was. They actually played a lot. So uh, nowadays, the only Godzilla film they've been playing right now is the original Gojira. But every once in a while, they will show the original American version of the film, which of course that does have garnered its fans. But also, a lot of people do like Raymond Burr's character of Steve Martin. And uh, after the actor Steve Martin became a uh, huge household name and actually had a... He later posted a cease and desist act from Toho and Hollywood to stop using his name in the Godzilla films. But uh, this film found a way as a giant middle finger fuck you to Steve Martin. Oh my god. Before I get to that, here's the thing. Mr. Martin's character actually became synonymous over the years, and of course, in Godzilla the Planet and the Godzilla anime trilogy on Netflix, they actually had a character called called Dr. Martin, who was clearly a reference to Steve Martin's character. So yeah, a lot of people actually do so yeah, even Toho actually likes the likes the Steve Martin character a lot too. But unfortunately it couldn't be used him ever since Steve Martin became a thing. Before the Steve Martin actor came out. But <laughs> This movie wanted to post a, during the credit sequence uh, when they were showing all the newspaper clippings. Told, uh, the director found, a, found a, a loophole as a giant fuck you to Steve Martin that they could actually use the name now. Uh, there was actually a clip that actually shows moth, a second Mothra egg, but the character, but here's what, here's the thing. The article was wrote, it was written by a Stephen Martin. Yeah, just put an N at the end of... Yeah, there's the loophole. They use the name Stephen Martin. That's the fuck you to Steve Martin, the, the actor. <laughs> so yeah, the Godzilla... So yeah, Godzilla fans and, and Toho got back at him. It's like, hey, they was an N Hey, we can't use your name Steve Martin in the movies, but we, we didn't say anything about Steven. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That worked out so well. <sighs> what a masterpiece. <laughs> so, with that being said, which kinds of... Uh, so, do I actually recommend both films? You know what? Yeah, I do. The original Godzilla film is considered a is considered a classic in its own right. It's considered the greatest monster movie of all time by most film goers because the way the film was shot at the time, it was done with a shoestring budget, but they made it work in the end. 
And the suit actor who plays Godzilla brought Godzilla to life and, well, had tons of health problems during the, during the filming, but he did his best to bring the character to life. And you know what? 70 years later, oh yeah, Godzilla's still going strong. We had Godzilla minus one, Godzilla minus one, minus color. <laughs> in theaters here in the U.S., they dominated. They did so well. They were a huge box office success here in the United States. In fact, Godzilla minus one was not was actually nominated for an Oscar for best visual effects and won the best visual effects too. And you know, it's even kind of weird seeing. It's actually kind of weird seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger say Godzilla for the first time. Yeah, I Godzilla finally gets an Oscar, and I finally get to hear Arnold Schwarzenegger say Godzilla. Okay, seriously, Arnold, you should have been in the Godzilla movie years ago. I mean, honestly, you as a military advisor in a Godzilla film? Oh, yeah. But the whole thing with him and Danny DeVito doing the whole, we both uh, we both heard you killed Batman. That, my friends, is Hollywood gold. <laughs> Right there on the spot. They just improv the whole thing. And Nick Bear is even more hilarious. Michael Keaton was right there, too. It's like, it's like, Batman, you know, it's like he's here. He's right over there. Look, it's like, oh, there you are, Batman. You have a lot of damn nerve to be here, you son of a bitch. And what does Michael Keaton do? Bring it. Bring it on, boys. <laughs> oh, I am so sorry for that. That was just gold right there. That was just fucking gold. Oh, God. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. And also, the recent Godzilla film, Godzilla uh, X Kong, The New Empire, actually did surprisingly well, too. Good reviews, and of course, the fight sequences with Godzilla and Kong were really good this time around, too. So there's, there's another film coming out because of that. And season two of Monarch has actually just been greenlit. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, Godzilla's not stopping anytime soon. Thank God for that. <laughs> or should I say, thank Godzilla for that. <laughs> but yeah, I do highly recommend watching both films because they left a massive legacy of films behind them. 70 years later, and they're still going strong. Yeah. Hail to the King of the Monsters, Godzilla. Anyway, that was my 300th episode. I'll see you all next time for some... Actually, I don't even know what the next one I'm going to do. I may just take a break for a while. Anyway, 4th of July is coming up. You all have a happy 4th of July, and I'll see you next time. Xerox Frank, signing out.